Well, then let's turn uh, to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. I'm going to read the verses 1 through 31. That's the 31 verses of the chapter. Our text this afternoon is from verses 16 through 18 of this chapter. Our Lord uh, Jesus Christ says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. If he had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest then, thou then show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the Prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. 
but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. And uh, may the Lord actually encourage us uh, from his word as uh, we read what really in many ways is one of the final addresses of uh, Jesus Christ uh, to uh, his uh, uh, disciples and to the New Testament church. Let's uh, take up uh, uh, those verses 16 to 18 then in John 14. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. John 14 contains a series of truly extraordinary promises that uh, Jesus gave to his disciples on the Thursday evening immediately prior to his crucifixion. Indeed, John 14 uh, takes us into the upper room in Jerusalem on that Thursday evening. It was there that Jesus uttered the promise of our text and the hours before he endured the agony of Gethsemane and before he subsequently would drink the cup of God's wrath against our sins uh, on the cross of Calvary. In other words, uh, Jesus uttered these promises of our text as he stared down the awfulness of the cross and his agonising death. And though he was fully aware of what lay ahead of him, uh, and it's, I believe, brethren, impossible for us all together to comprehend what lay ahead of him, but nonetheless, though he was fully aware of what lay ahead of him, nonetheless he pushes uh, those things into the background and takes time to focus at this uh, juncture in his life upon the needs of his disciples. Indeed, in John 14, Jesus ministers to the anxieties and the fears of his disciples. Uh, there we find uh, that uh, he takes up those things were, which were proving troublesome and uh, causing consternation among his disciples. It's worth noting that uh, John 14 uh, is intimately uh, connected also to John 13. In John 13 and verse 1, we read, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew, notice that when he knew that his hour was come, and that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own, we are told, he loved them unto the end. And what we find in John 14 is a very practical expression of Jesus' love for his disciples. The immediate background of our text uh, was that Jesus and his disciples had celebrated the Passover together there in the upper room in Jerusalem. Judas Iscariot uh, by this time had been sent away into the night to pursue uh, his uh, evil design. The Lord's Supper had been instituted. Uh, now Jesus can speak freely and he does speak freely uh, with his disciples, those disciples whom he loved and who loved him. Uh, he'd earlier that evening spoken to his disciples about going away. You read that in John 13 and verse 33. There he says, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you. The disciples had little or no comprehension, though, of what Jesus meant when he spoke about going away. So much so that uh, Peter asks in verse 36 of John 13. Lord, whither goest thou? Or in other words, where are you going? And to which Jesus responds, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Manifesting his ignorance, Peter uh, continues, Lord, why 
can I not follow thee now? And though the disciples had little appreciation of what was about to transpire, Jesus knew that his death, uh, which was only hours away, he knew that his death would occasion enormous pain and confusion among them, and not only among the uh, eleven, but also among all of his followers. Their world and their hopes were about to be shattered. The stability, direction, guidance and assurance provided by his physical presence was about to be taken away. He was going away, but he would not leave his disciples comfortless. And so he says to them and to us in John 14 and verse 1 through 3, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. All this, however, was too much uh, for the disciples to digest. Yes, Jesus was going away, and yes, uh, they understood that he was going to prepare a place for them, and they also had heard him say that he would come again. But when? Where was he going? What was the place that he was preparing for them? And when would he come again? In the midst of their confused thoughts and unanswered questions, Jesus assures his disciples that his heavenly Father would provide for them another comforter. He was going away. The comforter was going away. But his Father would provide another to comfort them. And I will pray, says Jesus Christ the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Look at this word of God in this afternoon under the theme, the sending of another comforter. Divided it up under these three uh, sections or headings. The incomparable gift, secondly, the comforting assurance, and then finally, the absolute certainty. <laughs> Let not your heart be troubled. That actually is really the theme that runs through John 14. And it's a word that we as believers need uh, to hear even today. Let not your heart be troubled. What makes those words of consolation and comfort so truly remarkable was that the one who spoke them was himself uh, grappling with his own uh, very uh, troublesome issues and trials. And though confronted with the awfulness of Gethsemane and with the cross, uh, we find here that Jesus nonetheless was deeply conscious of the need to comfort his disciples and to make preparation for his uh, physical absence uh, from them. As we've mentioned, only a few hours that lay between him and the cross and all the powers of darkness would be let loose upon him. And notwithstanding what awaited him in his compassion, and out of a concern for his disciples, uh, with their well-being in mind, he says to them, let not your heart be troubled. Such an exhortation was necessary because the hearts of the disciples were going to be deeply troubled by what would transpire that uh, night and the following day. The very foundation of their faith would be shaken. Indeed, what they had heard and seen already that evening had uh, left them in a state of perplexion. There were the somewhat mystifying and ominous words that Jesus had uttered when he distributed the bread and the wine. He said, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And he's gone on to say, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And the language of Jesus on that occasion seemed to carry with it the suggestion that he was going away, that he was going to die. My body, which is given for you. He spoke of doing things in remembrance of him. And those words seem 
to indicate uh, something that had to do with his death. And those words also seem uh, to gel with other things that Jesus had said to them only two days earlier. Uh, no doubt they recall what he'd said, you know, recorded in Matthew 26 and verse 2. On that occasion, he said, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. And furthermore, earlier that same evening, uh, he had spoken about going away, but where was he going? And moreover, he had informed them that where he was going, they could not come. But why couldn't they come? None of these things seemed to make all that much sense to the disciples. Jesus' statements did not fit with their conception of him as the Messiah, as the Christ. Wasn't he soon to establish his kingdom? Wasn't he soon to restore the throne of David and deliver Israel from the grinding oppression of the Romans? Uh, wasn't that going to happen soon? And weren't they, as his disciples, going to occupy the primary places of authority in that kingdom? What he had said that night, and particularly at the supper, had suggested something very different to what they were anticipating. Uh, what he had said suggested that momentous things were about to occur. Yet the disciples did not fully grasp what those things were, nor did they appreciate the significance of those things. And furthermore, unbeknown to them, huge responsibilities were about to be thrust upon them. Jesus was going away. He would soon leave them, and the work which he had come into this world uh, to accomplish would soon be completed. Indeed, when that work was completed, he would return to his Father and to the glories of heaven. But his disciples, and not just the eleven, were to remain. Those who believed him to be the Messiah, who had placed their trust in him, and men such as those two men that you read of in Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus, uh, those uh, and like-minded men will be left. The New Testament church will be left in the world, left in the world without uh, her Lord and Master, left in the midst of a hostile world. And just as the, world, the church today lives in the midst of a hostile world, so the church of that day lived in the midst of a very hostile world. Like the eleven and every New Testament believer, and brethren, we are pilgrims and strangers on the earth, and our pilgrimage requires us to live in the midst of a sinful and hostile world. And it's not an easy task. It's not an easy task today. It was not an easy task in the days of Jesus Christ and certainly not in the first century uh, AD. Not an easy task because we battle Satan and his minions. We battle an unbelieving and hostile world, not to mention uh, our own remaining corruption. The eleven would uh, shortly also receive this commission from Jesus Christ himself. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They were to become responsible for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were to become responsible for the gathering of the church of Jesus Christ in that New Testament, the first new first century of the New Testament church. And though the eleven may not have realised it, uh, they uh, certainly would encounter severe opposition as they engaged in that task. Opposition would come not simply from Satan, not simply from the hostile world, but came even from within the midst of the professing church of that day. Uh, there would be great hostility uh, from the uh, leaders among the Jews. 
indeed many of those uh, who would engage in that work among the 11 themselves, many who engaged in that work would actually be persecuted for their faith and their service of Jesus Christ. Some, in fact, uh, quite a number, would actually lay down their lives uh, in the service of their Lord. And so confronted with all those issues and confronted with the con confusion uh, that had arisen by the, some of the statements of uh, Jesus, uh, we find here that uh, Jesus uh, actually addresses uh, his disciples uh, with words of comfort. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Jesus promised his disciples that he personally would pray for them. He would pray to his Father for them. What would he pray for? What would he seek from his Father? For another comforter. What does he mean by another comforter? Now, the Greek word translated comforter uh, is a word that you might be familiar with. It's the Greek word paraclete. And a paraclete is one who is literally called to come alongside. Called to come alongside. Just like a paramedic is one who has a knowledge of medicine, who comes beside or comes alongside another. So a paraclete, uh, at least in its narrowest meaning, is one who is called to come alongside in order to perform the role of an advocate, one who pleads the cause of another. That's the, the narrow meaning of the word paraclete. You find the, that word used in the scriptures in First uh, John 2 and verse 1, where John employing that same Greek word describes Jesus as an advocate. He says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate, a paraclete, uh, with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And that, though that's one of the meanings of the word paraclete in the scriptures. It's also worth noting that the word paraclete also in the scripture carries a broader meaning. And it refers actually to one who comes alongside another, not just to advocate for another, but who comes alongside another in order to help and to assist, to comfort and to hold up, even to teach, to admonish and to protect such was Jesus Christ's loving concern for his disciples that he actually promises them that he would ask his heavenly father to send another comforter, another paraclete, another helper, another one to come alongside them. Yes, to plead their cause, but also not only to plead their cause, but also to teach and to instruct and to aid and to assist. Jesus Christ himself, of course, was a comforter. He was a paraclete. He was one who came alongside his people, not only to advocate on, behalf, on their behalf, but also to help and to aid them. He counseled, guided, upheld and comforted his disciples throughout his earthly ministry. He admonished them, he instructed them, he pleaded their cause. But he would shortly be leaving and his disciples, his uh, church, will be left alone in the midst of an antagonistic world. And so therefore Jesus would ask the Father to send another comforter, another paraclete, another not simply in the sense of a new comforter, nor just a different comforter, but another in the sense of another of like kind, Jesus would request his father to send a comforter who would be like unto him, and who would take his place and who would in his absence uh, supply all that he had supplied and would have supplied if he had actually remained upon this earth. Such was the care of Jesus Christ for his disciples and for the New Testament church. 
Jesus besought his father for one who would fulfil exactly the same role as he had fulfilled. One who would help, one who would protect, one who would instruct and guide, and one who would plead the cause of his people. Who was this comforter that Jesus would ask the Father to send and whom the Father would send? The comforter, of course, was the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity. That's indicated in our text uh, by the description of him as the Spirit of Truth. I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth. Uh, The identity of, of course, the comforter is made even plainer in verse 26 of this same chapter where we read, But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And so Jesus here uh, promises his disciples, promises the New Testament church, and uh, by virtue of that he promises, brethren, you and I, to send uh, the Holy Spirit uh, to us. Now, we ought not to think that the disciples did not already have the Spirit. They did. That's evident from verse 17, in fact, of this chapter, where we read that even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, but ye know him, ye the disciples know him, for he dwells with you, says Jesus Christ. But here Jesus promises his disciples that they would not just receive the Holy Spirit, but they would receive the Holy Ghost in a measure uh, far greater than had ever been received heretofore. And so Jesus' promise concerned what would actually occur on the day of Pentecost, of which we read in Acts chapter 2. Pentecost uh, was to be celebrated in a little over 50 days at time from these events that we read here in John 14. At that time, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, would be poured out upon the disciples and upon the New Testament church, poured out to an extent and degree previously unknown. In the Old Testament, the Spirit had only been poured out in a limited measure, now one might say that the Spirit had been dribbled out upon the church in the Old Testament. But at Pentecost, the disciples would receive the Spirit in a new and richer way. The Spirit would be poured out upon the New Testament church. Uh, he would be poured out in abundance. That's better than, by the, one of the, one of the, by the way, one of the blessings that we have uh, over and above the Old Testament saints. We have the Spirit of God poured out upon us in a measure that the Old Testament saints never enjoyed. It should be appreciated that Jesus' promise of another comforter was designed as a word of encouragement and comfort, not just to his disciples, not just to the eleven, or even to those that waited on his ministry at that time, but the promise is a word of encouragement and comfort to every believer in the New Testament age, to word to us, it's not only as his disciples, it's not only his disciples who stood in need of help, but we stand in need of help. We need to be encouraged. Uh, sometimes the uh, way forward for the Church of Jesus Christ looks very bleak. Sometimes that's by virtue of the attacks of Satan. Other times it's by virtue of the world in which we live. Sometimes it's also by virtue of our own uh, remaining corruption. But the Church of Jesus Christ needs to be encouraged, it's not so easy, not so hard rather, to become despondent in the, uh, in the church of Jesus Christ. And so we stand in need of constant assurance, comfort and help. And that assurance, comfort and help comes to us uh, specifically by way of the Holy Spirit. The issues that confronted 
uh, the disciples following the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in the first century AD remain essentially the same issues that we as believers face today. And we need to help, we need help to press on. Uh, we need help to overcome the temptations, to overcome the sins. We need help to bear true witness to Jesus Christ, to bear up under the trials that uh, come our way. They're not just trials that come to us as individuals, there are certainly those trials, but there are trials that come to the Church of Jesus Christ, that come to the body of Christ. Uh, it would please Satan uh, greatly if he could pull down uh, the uh, cause of Jesus Christ. Uh, it would please Satan no end if he could pull down the witness of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church of Australia. And so we, we need the help and assistance of the Holy Spirit. At Pentecost, uh, the Father would give to his disciples and to the New Testament Church another comforter. The Father would send uh, the Spirit, His Spirit, His Spirit, which was the source of all truth, the source of all that was objectively true. He would send that Spirit into the world, that Spirit who teaches and instructs. It would be that Spirit that would give the New Testament Church to understand a greater measure of truth and enable them to confess that truth and to live out of that truth. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit, of course, is confirmed by what we read in John 14, 26 here. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, notice this, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said Unto you. That's uh, not the only, but it's one of the primary roles of the uh, Holy Spirit in the midst of the New Testament church. As the Spirit of truth, as he's described here, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who would actually testify of Jesus Christ, who is the truth. He would testify of the one who declared concerning himself. Uh, John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And hence the Comforter would set before the disciples and before every uh, child of God, Jesus Christ. Jesus was going away, but the Spirit would testify him, and he would do so through the word of truth. Notice that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, would not be poured out indiscriminately upon all. That's verse 17. And he shall give you another comforter, even the Spirit of truth. Notice this, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Being the Spirit of truth, the world, the carnal world, the world that does not look in faith, to Jesus Christ, cannot receive him. What the Spirit teaches is completely foreign to the unbelieving, unregenerate heart. They might hear the word of truth. Indeed, they do hear the word of truth. But they cannot and they will not receive it and embrace it. Indeed, they refuse uh, to believe what they hear. And the reason for that is because, as we're told here, because the world seeth him not. The carnal world walks by sight and not by faith. The carnal world lacks spiritual sight and it walks consequently in spiritual darkness and therefore it cannot and will not embrace what its eyes cannot see. It failed to recognise Jesus Christ when he lived and taught among them and likewise it's unable to discern uh, the Holy Spirit that is also sent forth in this world to reveal 
that same Christ. That and the first reason is the first reason why uh, the world does not embrace him. But secondly, also, we're told here neither does the world actually know him. And you know, the truth is, the world can't know him. He does not want to know him. Nor does the Spirit reveal himself to that world. Therefore, the carnal world has no interest in Jesus Christ, no love for him. It rejects him. It refuses his help. By way of contrast, Jesus reminds his disciples, though, here, that uh, such was not the case with them. But ye know him, he says, verse 17, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. There's the difference between the believer and the unbeliever. Uh, for the believer, the believer knows uh, uh, the the Spirit, and uh, through the Spirit they know Christ, uh, for, the, for he dwelleth with you, the Spirit dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. The believer knows the Spirit experimentally, affectionately, and savingly. How is that so? It's so because the Spirit dwells within every believer. The Spirit lives within the heart of every believer. If you're a believer, if I'm a believer, if you trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation, if I trust in Jesus Christ for my salvation, then the Holy Spirit lives within you. He lives within me. You see, there's an intimate spiritual union and connection between every believer and the Holy Spirit. Hence, the Spirit is always at our side, always there to be our comforter, to be our help, to be our guide, to be our teacher, to admonish, to protect, to bless. It's the Spirit who moulds the mind and the heart of the believer and he does that through the word of truth. He brings that word to our remembrance. And through that word, he shapes our lives. And through that word, he leads and guides us. Yes, at times he rebukes and corrects us. But nonetheless, he is always our constant companion. Every step of faith, every manifestation of love, every act of obedience, every pure and holy thought, every good work, that we ever perform or engage in is the result of the indwelling of the Spirit of God within us. Notice also that Jesus' promise was also that the Spirit would abide with his disciples and with the New Testament church forever. Uh, this Spirit would never uh, go away. I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. The gift of the Spirit would not be temporary. The Spirit would not come and live alongside the believer only for a few years as Jesus had done. But the Spirit would abide forever. The Spirit would, having taken up residence in the heart of the believer, never leave. Now, brethren, there may be times when that's not absolutely clear to us, times of backsliding, times when we've uh, wandered off on our own frolic, and when we've uh, sought to rely upon our own strength. Uh, perhaps even we go so far as Peter ultimately did, even to deny uh, his Lord. But nonetheless, even though there may be times in our lives when we don't enjoy the conscious presence of the Holy Spirit, the truth is that that Spirit will never, never withdraw himself from the believer. He does abide with us forever. It ought to be enormous comfort to our heart, even in the midst of our own stupidity, our own sin, our own uh, 
pursuit of interest, our own interests, uh, the Lord never leaves us, uh, never abandons us, never says, well, if you're going to do that, you can fend for yourself. Uh, but the Lord is always watching out, conscious, consciously caring uh, for his people. Brethren, the gift of the Holy Spirit ought in itself to be a comfort to every believer. However, our text also contains an assurance that as believers, as those who struggle with all of the issues that come with life in this world, uh, we should take heart through this promise. Notice what Jesus says to his disciples and to us there in verse 18. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The Greek word translated there, comfortless, refers to being left an orphan. Of course, an orphan is a child whose mother and father have died. And uh, an orphan is one who's been deprived of the love and care uh, of either or both mother and father. And so an orphan is one who's bereft of family, left to fend for themselves. Jesus says here, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you to be a defenceless orphan. I will not leave you without love and care. I will not leave you without guidance and direction, without comfort, without assurance. We see here, yes, Jesus was going away but he was in no sense abandoning his people. He says, I will not leave you. I will not leave you comfortless. But he says, I will come to you. I, says Jesus Christ, will come to you. Then that raises the question, doesn't it? Given that Jesus was going away, how could he say uh, that I will come to you? Is he referring here simply Uh, to his eventual coming upon the clouds of glory at the last day? The answer is that's not what he's referring to. That's certainly true, but it's not what he's referencing here in our text. How how would Jesus Christ uh, come uh, to his disciples? Uh, Jesus Christ would come to his disciples at the day of Pentecost in the person of of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ would come to his disciples at the day of Pentecost. But how specifically would he come? Yes, the Holy Spirit would come on the day of Pentecost, but how specifically would Jesus Christ actually come to them on the day of Pentecost? The answer to that is the Holy Spirit is also the Spirit of Christ. Following his ascension into glory, uh, the Father gave to his Son the third person of the Trinity. He gave to his Son that third person of the Trinity so that he might pour out that Spirit upon the New Testament church. Yes, it was the Holy Spirit that was poured out on the day of Pentecost, but it's also true to say that it was the Spirit of Christ that was actually poured out on the day of Pentecost. And it's the Spirit of Christ as a consequence that dwells within our hearts. Uh, Jesus Christ did come on the day of Pentecost. It's that Spirit who works in our hearts and indeed who draws us closer and closer to Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter testifies uh, to this very truth in Acts uh, chapter 2, and verses 32 and 33. Uh, notice an explanation of what was actually taking place on the day of Pentecost. Uh, Peter uh, says, speaking of Jesus, this, he says, and I quote, This Jesus hath God raised up, 
whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. It was Jesus Christ who actually spread forth what they saw on the day of Pentecost. Uh, and just to confirm that the concept of the Spirit of Christ, uh, the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Christ, is not something that's just simply been concocted. Uh, you find in the Scripture reference to the Spirit of Christ. For example, in Romans 8 and verse 9, you read uh, where Paul says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not, notice this, the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And you find similar reference in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 11. There again, there is reference specifically to the Spirit of Christ. Yes, the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is also rightly designated the Spirit of Christ. And Jesus Christ has not left uh, uh, his disciples. He did not leave his disciples. He has not left uh, the New Testament church as orphans in this world. Uh, the great news, the glorious news, the encouraging news is that we're not alone. We've not been left to simply fight the battle uh, by ourselves. We're not here just simply to struggle uh, on our own. But the comforter, the Spirit of Christ has been sent to us and he lives within the heart of every believer, teaching, guiding, comforting and assuring us. And that Spirit of Christ will dwell in the hearts of God's people uh, forever. But then Jesus' promise of another comforter was absolutely certain. It might be thought that when he said in verse 16, and I will pray the Father, that there might be some uncertainty about the sending of another Father. He might pray that the Father would send another comforter, uh, but would the Father actually uh, do that? Uh, but the sending of another comforter was absolutely certain. And that's reflected in Jesus' own words, where he says, and I will pray the Father, notice this, and he says, and he shall give you, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. You see, there was no question whatsoever that the Father would not send another comforter. Now, that had already been determined in the covenant or the council of redemption before the world began. The sending forth of the Spirit of Christ uh, was determined before this world ever came into existence and the uh, sending forth of that spirit had been determined to occur on the day of Pentecost. Brethren, we are not orphans in this world. We might find that uh, life in the church uh, can prove to be difficult and sometimes it is. And sometimes we might find that the church struggles in the midst of the world in which we live. Uh, that's true. But we're not orphans in the world. As a result of Christ's work upon the cross, upon, by virtue of his resurrection and his ascension, the Father has given to us another comforter. Not a different comforter, but in fact the same comforter in the person of the Holy Spirit, in the person of the Spirit of Christ. A comforter who by God's, who by God's grace we know and who dwells within us, and who shall abide with us forevermore. Amen.